Today we're going to install a 1000 watt power inverter in the back seat of my truck. The smallest battery I can buy for this truck has 750 cold cranking amps and this one is rated for 850. This gives me some overhead for running small devices with the vehicle off, even at very low temperatures. We are going to run a wire from the positive terminal of the battery through this grommet into the dashboard. From there it will run through this side panel under the door sill, then underneath the seat where I will install a breaker, then over to the inverter on the back side of the center console. I don't need additional cup holders back here and there are already two in the doors. This space also proved to be pretty convenient for designing a 3D printed attachment. I'll start by removing the trim under the seat. This stuff is held on with body pins and comes off pretty easy when you know what direction to pull. The second piece is where I will mount the 80 amp 1000 watt breaker for the inverter. This platform is another purpose built 3D print. Onto the inverter. This was $60 on sale. The current it produces is a modified sine wave. This type may not be ideal for sensitive electronics and other types of equipment that require pure sine wave. More on this later. At first I thought the inverter could fit right into the cup holder, but I wanted to add a few additional features, and without some cutting, it wouldn't fit at all. The interface was easy enough to replicate, so I did. There are two holes for mounting screws, a few vent holes in the back, risers to promote airflow around the back and sides of the unit, and there's space for a one-foot power strip. You can find links to the print files and these products in the description. Now for the install. My 3D printer wasn't quite large enough for the ideal sized part, so there are small gaps on either side. A few things push me to install the unit at this location. If I put it under the seat, the AC vent will blow cold, humid air at it. This can condense and cause a short. Mounting under the rear seat is an option, but at least for me, this won't work. One of the reasons why I bought this vehicle in the first place was this nice big flat space that is great for hauling cargo. I didn't want to screw that up by bolting something onto the floor here. To start the wiring process, this unit has a chassis ground screw on top of the common negative ground terminal. I connect this to a mounting screw on the center console. Be sure to attach it to a metal surface that is grounded through the frame. If the surfaces are painted, you may want to scrape off some of it to ensure good contact. I wanted to put the breaker inside the vehicle so that I could easily disconnect it without having to pop the hood. This particular inverter has a slight current draw even when the unit is off. In order to prevent unwanted drain on the battery when it is not in use, I will be using this breaker as a kill switch. The platform is designed to prevent any contact with metal surfaces and the carpet. It also keeps it out of the way of the AC vent. Another common location for this style of breaker is under the hood. Just be sure to mount it to something plastic to prevent a possible short. Next up, the door sill and the fuse box panels need to go. All these are held on with body clips or body pins. Now we have access to the dashboard and the wire chase. There's just enough room for us to work. Rather than drill a hole in the floor for cable access to the engine bay, we are going through a big rubber grommet supplied by the factory. It's located on the firewall behind the dash, right up there. Here it is from the engine side. Only the positive red wire will need to go through this. As for the black, negative, or ground wire, we want to pick a space on the frame or a panel that we can run a significant amount of power through. Here at the fuse box, we can see the factory ground. I don't want to interfere with the fuse box in any way, so I will be drilling a new hole for this mount. Let's prep the wires. For this, you don't really need any fancy tools, just a heavy-duty set of scissors. Be sure to use the proper gauge of wire. This will be based on the overall length of the cable. 
My positive wire will be about 12 feet long, so I'm using a 4 gauge jumper cable for this project. To apply the cable lugs, I like to use a vise and a screwdriver to securely crimp the wire. Always check to make sure the connection is solid. Next, we'll apply some heat shrink tubing. I like to double this stuff up where the lug meets the wire. It can be a bit sharp there sometimes, and this can help prevent anything from poking through. A heat gun or torch will do the best job of shrinking the tubing. Move the workpiece around as you heat it to prevent it from overheating or catching fire. A side note, the size of the hole in the lugs should only be slightly larger than the stud that you are bolting it to. The one I'm using here is a bit too large. These get bolted on with lock washers to make sure that they will not get loose over time. Until this point, I have not connected anything to the vehicle's electrical system. Now that we're at that phase of the build, I go ahead and disconnect the battery. Be sure to pin the cable in a way so that it can't accidentally reconnect. The factory grommet has a small bulb that we will run our cable through. This needs to be cut open. The hole is not quite as large as the 4 gauge cable that we're using. This will make a great seal, but it will be a tight fit. The only way I was able to get it through was with a fair amount of grease and some creativity. Once the wire is through the chase, it will need to be routed through the carpet. Under the seat, there is a hole where the AC vent pops through. I was able to get my arm in there to grab the wire. I am not a professional when it comes to automotive wiring. Be sure to consult someone that is knowledgeable about this stuff if you have any questions or concerns when working with your own vehicle. I tighten this bolt down after making sure that there is no contact whatsoever between the wires and the seat. For no particularly good reason, the ground wire went on in the reverse direction. I attached it to the inverter and then routed it through the carpet. This proved to be significantly more challenging than going the other direction. The wire really wanted to get hung up on the seat bolts. Eventually, I got through the carpet and along the wiring harness. Then it marked where it would connect to the front quarter panel. Always check that you are not accidentally drilling into anything on the opposite side of the hole. Also take precautions to not throw metal chips all over anything like a fuse box. Because we need a solid metal to metal connection here, we will need to file off some paint and clean the contact area. This space was too tight to get a hand in, but with the help of a magnet, the bolt found the hole. The worst case scenario is I drop the bolt and then have to listen to it rattle around inside of the door panel for the next 100,000 miles. A quality ground location for a device like this will be a thick piece of metal that is connected directly to the chassis. There is a sizable junction at the positive terminal, so I found a position that seemed like it would work. 
Before reconnecting it, I removed some of the built up corrosion and then bolted it all down, making sure that the new wire will not obstruct the movement of the hood in any way. Using what's called split loom, I cover the cables in the engine bay for some additional protection from the heat and corrosion. It's also a good idea to use this on the inside of the vehicle. Though it may not be the best material for this process, the whole cable got wrapped in some high temperature electrical tape. Wrapping it with as few stops and starts with the tape is ideal. If you can do the whole cable with a single strand, you're better than I. Now it's important that the cable get tied to safe locations in the engine bay. Basically, zip tie it to things that don't move and don't get very hot or very cold. When finished, the cable should not be able to move any significant distance. One last thing I did was to add some silicone terminal covers to prevent any accidental contact with the bare wires. Then I flipped the breaker to establish the connection to the inverter. Let's try this thing out. That seems good. A bit anticlimactic, but it works. The floor mats still fit, and none of the interior space has been lost in the process. Because I don't have an auxiliary battery to run the inverter, I don't plan on powering anything larger than maybe a cell phone charger with the vehicle off. It's worth noting that my truck makes a loud beeping sound if the inverter is in the on state when cranking the ignition, so I need to be sure to keep it off during startup. If you know why this is, be sure to leave a comment. As I mentioned earlier, this particular inverter has modified sine wave output. This can cause AC devices to run at less than peak efficiency. As a result, some devices will overheat when operating on this type of power. I'm planning on doing some multi-day camping with a few people and we're going to bring along this mini freezer. It's dramatically cheaper than a refrigerated cooler and it has double the storage capacity. Unfortunately, it is the sort of device which may not like modified sine wave power, and as a result, it may end up damaging the compressor over time. Refrigerators also don't like to operate at over 110 degrees Fahrenheit, so a hot car and a high operating temperature may be a death sentence for this device. I'll post in the comments about my experience. Many thanks for liking, subscribing, and of course commenting on anything that I got right or wrong in this video. I can always afford to learn more. As always, thanks for watching.